right, so um, this is History Room Live, and we are going to talk about sharing your story today. Um, Karen has prepared a presentation uh, about writing a memoir or uh, <laughs> autobiography, what have you. Um, I should have said earlier that History of Room Live is something that Karen and I dreamed up a couple of months ago at the beginning of the shutdown in order to share our collections and our resources with our patrons um, while we're closed. So we will be offering that um, a couple times a month or maybe weekly for the time being. And I will let Karen take it away, I think. And um, after she's finished her presentation, I also promised that I would give a brief introduction to our online archive um, for our COVID-19 story project. So um, I'll look forward to showing you that in a little while. But here is Karen. Um, take it away. OK. Hello, and I'm actually going to turn off my video and minimize all this. Let's see. Okay, let me start my screen share. Uh, host disabled participant screen share, so apparently that needs to be turned back on. I like the butterfly. Yes, this was, I took this several years ago in my mother's backyard. Jill, you are, oh, perfect, thank you. Got it? Okay. Sorry Got about it. that. Okay. Let me get this thing going. And it's taking its time. There we go. We're almost there. Now let me just swap this out because <laughs> it always puts the wrong thing on the wrong screen. Okay. So hello folks, I'm Karen and I've been volunteering in the History Room for several years now. Um, last summer I was added to the staff as one of the substitute library assistants. I'm very interested in family history, so naturally, even though this is the story of you, you'll likely see some genealogy influence in what I talk about. This will be a brief, broad talk about some of the things to think about regarding writing your own story. I'm not a writer, but I have seen and heard a lot of discussion about this topic, so I'm basing this more or less on comments and, and advice from people who have done this. Now, people can come up with many reasons why they don't want their, their stories. They think their life is ordinary, maybe even boring. I'm sorry, did you say something? I giggled. Okay. Um, <laughs> So who would be interested in your story? This is what a lot of people think. Lack of time, of course, is one of the more difficult challenges. Even people who want to write often don't because they're so busy. These last two are, ex are certainly understandable fears or hesitations. Um, you know, that you're not a writer or you wouldn't know how to get started. If you've never written before, the thought of trying to figure out where to start can seem intimidating. I hope this brief presentation will make you think differently about it, maybe even be more excited about the idea of writing your story. And these are some of the things I'll talk about today. And I realize this looks like a lot, but it actually won't take long to get through. So we'll talk about, you know, your approach, your audience, your preferred format. Uh, and of course, you need to know what story you want to tell, uh, what inspires you, and also cover ethics tools, some publishing possibilities, educational opportunities, um, and of course at the end there will be some resources. So what approach will you use? Maybe you prefer the really casual approach of journaling and writing whatever strikes your fancy at the time. Some people write about their day, just whatever happens, so it's really low-key. Others write whatever random thoughts or memories come to mind. Some even write poems or draw. You can have, you know, art, art can be great for expression as well. There's a lot of freedom with this approach. On the other hand, maybe you need some structure and some prompts. So you choose to use one of those books that has questions such as a grandparent book. 
and I'm sure there are also some, you know, write your own story type of books that do the same thing without the focus on grandparents. You can also find apps that will send you writing prompts, such as StoryWorth, for instance. This is one that I heard about at a uh, genealogy technology conference. Uh, you'll be sent a writing prompt once a week, and at the end of the year, if you choose this option, the company sends you a book of your answers. This will cost you about $99, and it has more of a family history flavor, um, but you can also choose to share your email answers with as many people as you want although likely you'd prefer something much cheaper or possibly even free. <laughs> I did a Google search of autobiography writing prompt apps and there were several results. I don't know about, about, enough about them to feel comfortable making recommendations, but I hope you'll look into it further if this is something you think will help you. And of course, people who do write um, would know more about these and I'm sure you can get plenty of advice from, from writers. Another type of prompts you can use are interview questions. These are typically open-ended questions and cover a variety of topics. And some will have a particular focus, so these can be useful as writing prompts. You can think of an autobiography as an interview of yourself, basically. Or maybe a book is your goal, or even more than one book. Whatever the case, whatever you choose, whether you choose to do this formally or casually, I hope you'll just get started. As you think about how you want to write, you also have to think about why, because the how might depend on the why. Who are you writing to, or to be really proper, to whom are you writing? <laughs> is this for you, for maybe therapeutic or other personal reasons? Is it for your kids or grandkids, you know, for posterity, descendants, and so forth? One woman said she began writing a letter to her grandchild when the child was born and just continued do, doing so for quite some time. It just became a really long letter. <laughs> Maybe you're writing for your community or is your reason for writing to pass on advice or experience or for social or political reasons. Perhaps you've been quite involved in social or political activism and advocacy and want to share your thoughts and experiences. And these are just a few of the possibilities. Another thing to consider is what format you want to use. Will you be keeping it really simple and just write in a journal of some sort, whether that be a store-bought journal or a notebook or a digital journal using your preferred word processing program? Maybe you want a blog, which could be considered another form of journaling, but with a wider audience. I included social media in this list because I know there are people who use it as a way to tell their story then use, for instance, the Facebook feature to create a book from their posts. This wouldn't be my first choice, but think about the types of things people write on social media. Many people are sharing their thoughts, feelings, experiences, knowledge, memories, and much more through Facebook and other means. Maybe hearing this as an option might make the whole idea of writing seem less overwhelming or add a new perspective to your thinking about it. After all, thousands of people are telling their stories every day in small bites, but are revealing their whole life stories over time. Perhaps writing in any form is difficult, or you simply don't want to. You might prefer to record yourself using an audio or video recorder. These days, it isn't hard to find a, a way to do that. There are many programs. Or you could dictate to a program like that Dragon Naturally Speaking, or the free version that comes with Windows. So, in that case, not necessarily recording it orally, but also not having to type <laughs> or write. Books are a traditional format, of course, but email is not. Yet it is an option, whether you email the family historian in the family or even email yourself. That might sound silly. One could say if you're going to email yourself, you might as well just write in a Word doc or whatever program you're using. The difference is how we think when we use these programs. You might feel less intimidated if you feel like you're just emailing someone, even if it is yourself. It might feel more casual, like less, less pressure. Or maybe it's a crazy idea. Either way, my point is sometimes the format or equipment can have more an in, of an impact than you realize. It never hurts to try something different, even if you only do it to get started. Another option is to tell your story using photos. Choose the photos that fit whatever story you want to tell, then add some description to give it context and meaning. 
Now, as I mentioned, the thought of writing your own story can certainly be overwhelming. It's one of the biggest reasons people don't do it, especially because when you think memoirs, you think book, and that could seem really daunting. What I suggest is you don't think of it as writing a book or as writing your life story. Just think about it in small pieces. Rather than trying to write about everything in your life, choose a particular event, time period, trajectory, or theme. It doesn't have to be chronological or anything like that. Some people think that they have to start at the beginning of their life and, and carry on from there. That's not the case at all. Uh, so for example, in, for an example of uh, you know a theme or adventure, my uncle has traveled ex extensively around both the US and the world. Many of these were cycling tours, but he has also done a lot of hiking and mountain climbing. He could easily fill a book just writing about one of these traveling adventures. Family, of course, is a common theme in many variations, you know, relationships or childhood or, or so forth. Uh, another example of, in terms of a family related idea, uh, my mother or any of her loving siblings could write an entire book on what it was like to grow up in a large family. And I can assure you any writings from them would definitely be humorous and would include plenty of stories of um, misadventures, I guess we'll call it. <laughs> Perhaps the story you want to tell is about your experiences within a particular community, whether that be a town or an ethnicity or some other form of community. Military, for instance, is one community that is a frequent subject. The Library of Congress has a veterans project, which includes many resources, such as interview questions. So if this is your chosen topic, whether you are the veteran or a family member of, uh, you may find useful resources on the website. And I've included the link in the resources slide at the end. I could easily go on about this. Um, there are so many other possibilities in here. Food, for instance, is always an excellent one. You could focus an entire either book or whatever format you're using just around food and, and how it fits in with traditions, culture, you know, stories of somebody sharing food or teaching you how to cook as a form of love, you know, that sort of thing. There's so much to it. Uh, accomplishments, you know, there's just so many ideas. Um, so a couple ideas that I've seen mentioned. One is to Google timelines of years to be reminded of what was happening during those years which is not something I would have thought of. I thought that was kind of a cool idea. I heard one person say they did this for each year as a reminder of what was happening in the world throughout their life. And in some cases, maybe it's, you know, of course there are tragedies that happened, you know, the Challenger and Kennedy assassination, but there could also be really good things that were happening in the world that you had forgotten about, or just simply things of interest that aren't necessarily good or bad, but just simply happened and could tie into your story in some way or could jog your memory or inspire you. Another idea I've seen is to use your resume as a jumping off point. And again, not something I would have thought of, but it could be helpful, you never know. I would also suggest that as you think about what story you want to tell, consider whether you want the focus to be action or deep thoughts or humor or something else, maybe even a combination of them all. Part of family history research involves interviewing relatives. It's well known that having objects handy can help jog memories or simply break the ice and get people talking. The same concept could be used when writing your own story. You can use pictures, music, or objects as prompts. I have some objects my grandfather made and they make me think of his wood shop. I can still smell the sawdust and picture some of the machines. Cooking, of course, is certainly inspiring, the process of it along with the smells and the taste. It can be really powerful. Locations uh, also inspire memories and stories. Last summer, a young cousin and I visited my great uncle and he took us on a driving tour of a couple small towns where he grew up and where his grandparents lived. He showed me where his childhood home had been that isn't there anymore, so I would never have known. Uh, he showed me where his grandfather's blacksmith shop had been. Again, it, that's not there either, so I didn't know where it was. Uh, and he showed me so many more things, and we all had such a great time. I heard so many stories that I can now share, and I learned a lot from him. 
and I really hope I get to do this with him again sometime. I do suggest that, of course, if you do go to a location that you bring a notebook or use a recorder so you can get your thoughts or memories recorded while you're out. Another inspiration, of course, is art. And this can take endless amounts of forms from, you know, ideas from museums, object, museum objects to a child's drawing. Another idea I read about is if you're writing by hand, maybe decorate your notebook, journal, or whatever you're using, because even something like that, personalizing it, um, can can sometimes help, you know, think of ideas or just get writing or maybe even just help you relax a little. And before I go any further, I do think it's important to point out that while you're considering what to write about, you should also be thinking about whether or not you should write about some things. When this comes up in conversations I've seen in, in genealogy groups, it can sometimes get a bit heated. Some people believe that if you deliberately leave out something, then it equates to censorship. Others believe that being mindful of others is more important than asserting one's right to write anything. I wanted to make a point of mentioning this because revealing some information could lead to negative consequences, such as strained or broken relationships. For instance, one member of a group I'm in said she shared information from the 1930s, and some relatives haven't spoken to her in over a decade because of it. And I realize the 1930s might sound like a long time ago, but consider that there are still the children of and grandchildren of somebody who would have been alive at that time, or the person themselves, if possibly. Um, the people tend to view writing or genealogy as simply a harmless hobby, but the reality is that both can have strong emotional impacts. I've listed some things here that can create rifts, if not handled sensitively. I can't tell you what's right or wrong. I can simply encourage you to consider any privacy issues and sensitive subjects. I don't know if legal issues would come up, but it's something to keep in mind. Um, so I just urge you to think about what you're writing, um, have some considerations, and understand that just because you can write something doesn't mean you have to or should. But again, it's it's you know your own situation better than anyone else, and every situation is different. So I will just leave it at that, and hopefully you you think about this. Now there are a number of tools. Uh, in forms of help for writers. I've listed some here that I've heard mentioned by writers, but I can't really tell you much about all of them. I do know Scrivener is a storyboarding tool. A well-known genealogist and writer, Lisa Alzo, talks about this quite often. She doesn't like to um, have to pay for things necessarily, and she'll only do so if she really, really likes the tool, and she definitely likes this one a lot. Um, and of course, I think Trello might be similar. I think that might also be either for storyboarding or it could be uh, another form of mind mapping. And mind mapping is something I am familiar with. There are several programs out there for that. Or you could just mind map on a whiteboard or piece of paper, whatever, whatever works for you. Of course, note taking programs are helpful, you know, like Evernote, OneNote, and there are many, many more. If you're speaking your story instead of writing, you might want a dictation program, such as uh, Dragon, naturally speaking, or the, um, the free one on the word program. Of course, you'll also want to check your spelling and grammar. The program you're using will likely have a built-in feature, but there are other options too, such as Grammarly. And obviously, you should always have somebody else read your work too, so that um, they can help you with editing, editing and word structure and, you know, how to how to frame your ideas and concepts and so forth and i guess that actually leads me to the next point which is one of the best helps is other writers i would suggest you find a writing group and learn from them and with them some libraries have writing groups which may or may not be meeting virtually right now even if there isn't one at your library it's possible someone on the library staff may know of a group or of someone who could help you find one and if you're on social media, you can also check for groups online, such as Facebook groups. 
However you find them, I do encourage you to reach out and discover what other writers may be able to share with you about their experiences, ideas, favorite tools, and so on. That really will be your best uh, option for learning. For those who are writing a book and want to publish, there are several options available. I've listed some here that I've heard about. Blurb and Lulu are used frequently by genealogists, so I'm a bit more, I'm a bit more familiar with those. I know with these two companies, you can make your book available to others to buy and print as they wish. So there's no need to spend money printing books and then hoping they sell. You can also choose to allow a preview of your book. And I've included a link in the resources to an example of one of those previews. And if there's time, maybe I'll actually open that link and go to it so you can see. And this here is just a screenshot of, um, I believe it was Lulu, <laughs> I'm sorry. I've, yeah, it was Lulu that I did a screenshot of. So you can get an idea of some of what they're doing, publishing, printing, connecting, selling, variety of, of things. And of course, there are educational opportunities. And you can find some through some free online courses such as Future Learn and Coursera. I hadn't heard of Udemy. I'm not even sure I'm saying that correctly, but I saw it in an article about writing. And I realize I already mentioned writing groups, but they're worth mentioning again. And I'm sure one of the uh, things they'll tell you is to read. You'll become a better writer from reading. Uh, but in the meantime, you can see here, I did a screenshot of Coursera, and they happen to have one that is specifically about memoir, memoir and personal essay, writing about yourself. I don't know exactly when it runs. They tend to um, have specific times. It's not necessarily a constant thing. But you can check back and sign up and they may have other writing classes that you're interested in as well and here we are at the resources page so this first one pfl uh, our outreach and instruction librarian roberta she created a web page with some tips about writing and that's the link to um, her web page that she created the next one is an article that I came across that has some, you know, simple, basic information. I was keeping it light. <laughs> Telling the Stories of Our Lives by Kurt Witcher is a video through a genealogy center or um, historical society. And I really liked it. I enjoyed it and I thought it was um, very informative. And I liked how he spoke as well. Kept it very relaxed and, and friendly. This last one here is the example book, uh, but let me flip through because I also have a couple of slides with some interview questions, some links to get to if you want some ideas for interview questions. The grandparent book, is there's an online version. I actually have the print version of these books and I absolutely love them. Story core questions, of course, because they, they, have, they have a lot of experience <laughs> with discussions. Interview questions for veterans. This is the one I talked about earlier, the Veterans Project at Library of Congress. And then the last two, a couple of articles that I found that uh, included interview questions. So I am going to stop the screen share. And if I can get my cursor where I need it to go <laughs> and make this work. There we go. Okay, so that was just a quick sample whirlwind tour based on my limited knowledge. <laughs> um, I can also bring up, I, I'm going to see if I can open up that uh, one web page. If I remember where I put it. Actually, you know, I'll turn it over to Jill for the time being, and if I come across it while she's talking about COVID, uh, and I can show it later. So I think that might be a better idea. So I'm passing the buck to Jill. Thank you. Um, before I change course, I want to see if anybody has any questions right now for Karen, or um, maybe you have some ideas of something to write about that you want to share. Um, does anybody want to speak up? Maybe later. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit about 
our um, project to collect COVID-19 stories from our community at Patent Free Library. I'm going to share my screen because I have a lot of things to show you online. Um, and, you know, it's always hard to do that. So I'm going to give it a shot. And <laughs> let's see. Can you all see this beautiful beach photo? Yes. All right. That so is this lovely. is yeah, and it's zoomed in a little. So I'll zoom out. Oh, I'm going to meet myself. Oh no, this is the correct side. So this is um something that was shared through our online portal. Um, I thought it was a nice place to start. I don't know where it was taken. I'm assuming Popham, but maybe it was Reed State Park. Who can say? Um, so this is the homepage for the How's Your Week Going project. Um, we called it the How's Your Week Going project because, you know, it's, it's a good prompt. Just tell us about your week. And um, I think at the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis, that's the thing that I said most to people. Hey, how's your week going? Because, you know, we were all just taking it a week at a time. And I think that we're still taking it a week at a time. Um, so I think this title is a pretty good prompt. In addition to that, um, we have some information about the project here on the website and our intentions to um, preserve submissions in perpetuity for future historians, future genealogists, and any of our library patrons who are interested in what happened during this time. Um, we include additional prompts at the bottom of the page here. And it's very easy to share. We created a web form, which you can click. And you see the prompt questions here again. And a couple of simple um, boxes where you can type in your title. This was my submission that I made um, a couple of days ago after I went to a secondhand store and I took a picture of myself. Well, I took a picture of a mirror and I happened to be in that picture. Um, and I was wearing a mask and it was just a picture that I was sending to my husband to see like, hey, do you like this? And of course he didn't care. Um, but I looked at it later and I thought like, this is the, a perfect submission to this project because it's just a tiny slice of our experience. Um, so it, your, your story, I think, for this project or for any project that you're undertaking, it doesn't have to say everything. It can just say a little bit. Um, so what we're asking for here is either some text maybe an audio file if you're more comfortable with speaking, or just a photograph for all three. Um, this is everything that we share with um, the public. We also share your name if you choose. And this information, contact info, that's just private information that we keep so that we can get in touch with you about your submission. And then there's uh, another section about agreeing to share the work, which we could discuss later if you're interested, but I would have to fill out all this information to get there, so I'll skip it. What I really want to show you today is the Omeka site where we're going to be sharing these stories with the public. So I'm really excited about this. Um, this is sponsored by the Maine State Library through an IMLS grant. Um, otherwise it would be a little bit difficult to set up an Omeka site on our own because it can be quite expensive. Um, so I have just had the opportunity to start adding uh, the stories that people have shared. I have about five items in the collection so far. 
of let's say 15 or 20 submissions that we have. So this is really a sneak peek. <laughs> this is the URL here, howsyourweek.omeka.net. Um, you can actually use that, R that URL and visit this now and browse yourself. Um, just know that it's a work in progress. If you click on the collection, how's your week going? You'll see a short description. And you can see some of the items that people have shared with us. Some of them are text items. And I think one of you will recognize this one. This is the submission itself which is a text file. And this is information about the submission, including the title, some of the subjects discussed, how we got it, who holds the rights, fun stuff like that. There's also a, a, nice, a nicer looking transcription of the text down here. So that was a text submission. There's also this submission, which was a text submission. Here's the text file and the transcription down at the bottom. But this one came with photos. So that photo that I showed you of the beach was included. And we'll go back to the text record to see the other related photos. This is from our state representative, Alison Hepler. She shared a selfie. So in the subjects, we have selfies, we have protective clothing, which that's the Library of Congress term for things like PPE, personal protective equipment. And you can use these subjects to browse or other items that have that subject. So she actually shared two selfies. This is Allison and I'm assuming her husband. Um, I'll have to ask her about that. <laughs> so that's actually everything. You've now seen everything that's in the collection. So although I didn't show you that you can search and I think you can actually search the text of the um, submissions. So I think both submissions mentioned phone calls. At least one of them did. So this mentions phone calls. So you can read a little bit more about that. So that's really all there is at this point. But it's going to grow and hopefully you can check back and see a little bit more next time. Um, there's one more thing that I want to share while I'm sharing my screen and then we'll come back together and have a chat. So this is uh, the Thompson Free Library. Tonight they're having a story slam. So if you want to see some examples of people telling their story, this is something that's open to everybody and it's at 6 p.m. So if you haven't got enough out of this, um, I really recommend checking this out. Thompson Free Library is also collecting COVID-19 stories. There are a lot of um, libraries across the state that are doing this and we're all doing these Omeka sites. So at some point you'll see them kind of presented all together and we'll get a big patchwork of um, stories from across the state. So I'm very excited about it. So I just wanted to share it with you today. Um, and that's all I have to share. So I will come back. And good, you're all still here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I'm grabbing the screen share, screen share just for a moment. I do want to mention right. too that, um, let's see, where did I put it now? There we are. Let me move this, I'm going to make that small and move this, um, that book. And I do want to mention that, um, of course, 
being the family history research, I, when Jill and I were talking about storytelling and stuff, uh, we very quickly realized we sort of have different, we, we come at it from different angles. Um, so today we were talking about it from the perspective of telling your own story. Of course, I would love and, and hope at some point that we will be able to talk about um, oral histories and family interviews and that sort of thing. And of course, the two are not necessarily the same as um, one of our guests in the group tonight, Anna, would be able to tell you she knows a lot about oral histories. And I think before we go, we'll have to give her a chance to um, plug her own facility. So this here is an example of, I guess you can call it a memoir that somebody wrote, and it was focused on a particular time and particular location. So that kind of fits in with some of the things I spoke about. And there's the preview button, and this is a blurb. You can go in and find examples of books to look at, see how other people have, have done things, how they've done their work. And see, once it gets there, I think I just do this. Yep. Yeah. Kind of just click on the side and um, it should progress. And I find it interesting. Let's see if I can make this bigger. I don't know if you can see the chapter names. So they're not like chapter one, chapter two. She gave them all interesting names and related to maybe something specific. And she's got some pictures in here along with text. So this gives you some idea of, you know, how this person did her book. And see, that chapter wasn't necessarily that long. And there's a family tree chart in there. Some more pictures and text. Um, and ooh, even an old letter journal. Well, look at that. that that's cool. I don't think I'd even gotten that far. So, <laughs> I'm going to stop sharing, but I wanted to show you that so you could see um, one of the things that, well, one of the examples out there. So, does anybody else have anything they want to talk about or share or questions or? And if there aren't any questions, I'm not going to put uh, Anna in the spotlight. <laughs> How about you go ahead and unmute yourself and tell us about where you're from, where you're working. All right. And Hi, everybody. I'm Anna Faraday. I am the archivist at the Franco-American Collection at the University of Southern Maine. Um, we are all currently working from home, just like everybody at the Patent Free Library, and we are working on um, expanding our uh, digital presence. Um, we are also hoping to do a little bit of COVID-19 related collecting um, and we are busily, um, busily adding things to our digital commons website um, through USM and also um, transcribing various oral histories that we have already digitized. And we were talking yesterday, because um, I attended, um, the, the, there's a group called the Vamond. Jill, I remember asking you about it a couple weeks ago, so yesterday was when I attended their webinar. And that's where I learned that the Franco-American Center has um, a scavenger hunt on Vamond. And I'm like, well, that sounds fun. And you don't have to leave your house to do it, which I made sure yes. to check. I'm like, do I have to leave? Do I have to go there to do this? And no, no, you can do this right from home, which is fabulous. Yeah, we um, developed the scavenger hunt back this winter previous to uh, COVID, but it was a great thing to have to be able to um, share with people as a resource um, that they can access from their phone. So Vermont is great, highly recommend. They look like they're very easy to work with. Out. Karen and I talked about putting together some kind of scavenger hunt as part of our collecting or as I don't know if we could do it, do it in this format um, but it could be worth a shot and on that note there's one more thing that I have to share with you guys um, I don't want to forget that next week um, Jack who is another assistant at the history room is going to share his story map um, and Story Map is similar to Vermont. Um, it's 
uh, it's also a GIS based map where you can pin locations and add a lot of information, photographs, text, probably audio, who knows. Um, Jack knows. <laughs> so Jack is going to be sharing his story map that he made last year. It's called A Brief Walk Through History and it's a historical walking tour of Bath. So be sure to look out for that. Um, let's see, any questions about storytelling, about the uh, COVID-19 project? We can also wrap up early if you guys feel like it, or we can stop recording and just chat. Anna, did you have something you were about to say? Oh, uh, no, I, I just think that your COVID collecting project is really great and I am interested in developing a similar system where people can more easily write in because um, we haven't really done that yet. We haven't done a lot of advertising that we're collecting. So I'm trying to figure out how we're going to like launch it. And this is a yes. great, um, this is a great opportunity for me to examine what other people are doing. decide how you're going to collect those stories. We just decided to go with a WordPress web form because it was something that we could just do really quickly. Um, I know that other libraries like the Thompson Free Library, their project is 100% based in Omeka and so they have a submission form within Omeka and it, it's all dealt with within that system. Um, and then there are other libraries within the state who are doing different things. Portland Public Library, um, Matthew at UMaine is doing a different style project. I think he's using Google Docs partially. Um, so Anna, I'll send you more information about the group if you'd like. Uh, we've been meeting to discuss our projects and um, we're always trying to find more people. So <laughs> I'll send you more info. And I probably should have mentioned earlier that uh, if anybody's interested, I can turn that uh, the slide presentation into a PDF and I will send that along to Jill so she can put that up with the video. Yeah, I think Charity was interested in that and I thought it was a great presentation, Karen. It was beautiful. Oh, thank you. I know I, not to sound completely nerdy, of course, anybody who knows me knows <laughs> I am a little bit nerdy, but when Jill and I were talking, I said, um, I remember telling her, I said, and I was so excited because normally I make my own background slides and, and whatever, but there's a particular theme that that, that, um, that PowerPoint has it. I just absolutely love and I've been dying to use it and now it, it fits perfectly with this. So, I mean, I'm a total nerd because I was excited I got to use a particular theme in PowerPoint. How weird is that? But there you go. But thank you. I really appreciate that because I always get a little bit nervous. Um, and I do hope at some point we'll be able to also talk about, you know, interviews uh, and oral histories and, and that sort of thing. And I think yeah, me too. you also had some ideas about that. I think you said you had some thoughts on that too. But anyway. I, yeah. I have a question. Um, yes. Well, again, I'm so technology challenged. How do I get to the COVID-19 archives site again? Do I have to go to Patent Free Library first or it, do I use that uh, that URL that you gave us? If if I wanted to make a submission or if somebody I knew did, how would I send, you know, how do I get there? Um, that's a great question because I didn't actually show you how. I meant to and <laughs> I forgot. Um, so I'll describe it and then I'll show you. Um, if you go to the Patent Free website, there's two or three different ways that you could get there. I think the easiest, if you're on a web browser and you're not on your phone, there's a sidebar to the right. And the first item on that sidebar is your COVID-19 story. Oh, okay. That's easy enough. Um, so let me just quickly share my screen. I'll show you what I mean. So if I go to Patent Free Library's website, this is what I'm talking about, the sidebar right here. Yeah. 
We also have it in an event. And if you go to the History Room website, it's in the sidebar here. And I'm, I'm really pushing it pretty hard. It's here as well. Okay. So links will take no, you to. I really couldn't have missed it, but I did. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Um, and and I, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying, thanks for asking, Linda. Um, and I just wanted to go to one of the, a couple of these comments, um, because both Charity and Anna mentioned Evernote. Uh, Charity likes OneNote as well. But Anna, do you prefer Evernote over OneNote and other, um, other tools like it? I mean, maybe you know a little more about writing than I do, and, and you can actually give recommendations for such things. Um, so I actually haven't used OneNote, but I have used Evernote and I have used Trello. Um, we actually use Trello at USM for um, various uh, interdepartmental projects. So right now I'm on a Trello board for digital projects that we're all working on from home that are related to the digital commons. So um, I've used it for work and not for writing, but it could very easily be used for writing. It's, um, it's, it's really intuitive and good to use. And when you're done with stuff, you can just move it to the done and then you feel really accomplished. <laughs> now, would it be correct to say it's a storyboarding or is it more a mind map or kind of both or how would you describe it? I think it, I think it could be storyboarding. Okay. I think that's what you could call it. I mean, I was thinking that's what it was, but I'm like, shoot, I, you know, it's been a while since I've seen anything about it. And um, so I couldn't remember. Well, again, I'm ignorant. What's storyboarding? What is a story? I mean, I know what a storyboard is as far as television is concerned. I know that right. they used uh, to be put together. Mostly I've seen, like when I, because again, going back to being a nerd and liking to watch all those extras, all the bonus features in like Lord of the Rings, for instance, um, sort of at the beginning of their project, when they're sussing out their ideas and sorting it out, they'll have like these uh, boards, and I suppose that could take any format you want, where they, and you, anybody else here can correct me if they have a better <laughs> idea or a better way of explaining, but you kind of throw up, and it might be a drawing, a lot of times they're drawing. Right, they're, drawings, that's what I mean, that's what I think of as. Lay it out, but you lay it out in the, in the, the, the direction you want it to go, so, and then you can rearrange them. If you realize, actually, this part of the story belongs here, you can flip that. So I think, is that a pretty good explanation ah. or somewhat? Okay, yeah. So you can start with that and then and then move on to something more detailed. Go ahead. Yeah, Anna. and all that stuff is stuff you can do on Trello. You can move, you create little cards and you can move the cards around if you decide that they belong in a different place. So I think they don't tend to have necessarily a ton of stuff on each card because it's just sort of the beginning stages and you're you're working out where you want things to go and what concepts you even want to use. So it's kind of a cool idea. Now, Linda, of course, being an artist and musician, coming from a storytelling perspective, you could, you know, you'd probably think more in, in those terms. I don't know, you could write your story in, in music. No, I, I don't, music is, is in one place for me and, and verbal stuff is in another place. And that's one of the reasons I like being verbal because it allows me to use parts of my brain that music doesn't. I don't tend to merge them. Right, okay, that's cool. But I hope you are thinking of, you would have a fascinating, you could fill a whole series of books about your stories. I mean, that would be fantastic. Maybe yours, well, you don't have, I don't know, Anna, I mean, I know your focus is on Franco-Americans. I don't know if you'd talk about other groups as well, because I'm sure Linda <laughs> would have fascinating stories for an oral history, but um, anyway. So I think that wraps up at least what we were wanting to focus on. And uh, does anybody else have any other comments or questions or, or so forth? Well, thank you guys for joining us on a beautiful day. Thank you, Jill. 
Thank you, Karen. <laughs> Thank you. Nice to see you all. Thank you, Anna. Nice to meet you. Yeah, you too. Yeah, nice meeting you, Anna. Nice to meet you. Glad to be here. <laughs> um, okay. Well, it's 4.52, and that means we've got eight extra minutes to enjoy the day. So um, I'm going to sign off. I'll email the presentation slides, and we'll see you all next time. Okay. Ciao.